This is Andy Perrault for Boxing News. I'm joined by trainer Tony Sims here in Monte Carlo. Ch Tony, always a pleasure. How is life treating you? Yeah, yeah, good, thanks, mate. I'm glad to hear it. Obviously, you've got your IBF Super Featherweight World Champion Joe Cordina preparing to, ch to hold on to, uh, hopefully, in your eyes, his world title come Saturday night. Talk about the challenge ahead of him, Mr Vasquez. What do you know about him, Tony? What have you studied of him? What are you expecting? Yeah, he's, he's a typical Mexican and uh, comes forward, throws a lot of shots, tough kid. Like, a lot of them are like a stereotype of a fighter. They just, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're hard work. And when you're fighting a Mexican, you always know you're going to be in for a tough night. So, uh, Joe Caldina has prepared well for this fight and uh, he, he's looking forward to defending his title for the first time. Joe's first title, Tony's first title defence of Joe's since he's held the crown. I'm not saying he's going to be the case, but obviously there's all this talk about what could be next, a potential big domestic fights. He's mentioned to me just he'd love the Navarrete fight out in Vegas. Um, any sense of any conversation you've had to say, just to make sure you keep your eye on the ball, don't let complacency come in with somebody like a Vasquez who will be a bit more of an unknown quantity. And obviously we've seen a number of upset results over recent years. Yeah, you're right in what you're saying there. You know, you got to uh, keep your eye on the ball and I think Joe's experienced enough and professional enough to, to do that. He, he's had a good camp, he's had good sparring for this camp, which is sometimes, um, he's sometimes hard to get his weight at world level in, the, in Great Britain to get a top quality sparring, but he's had great sparring for this camp and uh, he, he's in great condition and I think he's looking forward to the fight. Joe said to me that he feels that maybe he's got one more fight beyond this super featherweight. Obviously, you're in the gym with him, you see his weight cut. Do you feel like that's probably aligned with your own plans with him and you agree with that maybe he's getting ready now to move up? Well, as you know, he started his career as lightweight and he won the British Commonwealth title at lightweight. So he, he, he's um, campaigned at lightweight before, but he, I, I feel like he can stay at super featherweight weight-wise for as long as he wants. I, I don't know whether he... he you know, I think in his mind he probably wants to do a unification and then he wants to move up into the lightweight division because there's like obviously bigger names and more money and at the end of the day, you know, being a professional fighter, you, that's what you do it for and uh, I think he's more inclined to think I'm going to move up a weight to fight bigger names really rather than him not being able to make the weight properly and uh, I think he makes the weight well. I mean, just on that note, obviously you mentioned 135. The top fighters of 135 are across over in the States, the likes of Shakur Stevens and Javante Davis. Um, obviously, some have more recently moved up to 140, your Ryan Garcia's, your Devin Haney's, and what have you. How difficult or easy would it be to try and secure one of those fights? I know in the past, Shakur and Joe have had their um, grumblings over social media. Yeah, um, when Shakur was a super featherweight champion, he, he actually started calling Joe Caldina out. and. Uh, they obviously knew each other from the amateur days and uh, that fight was always rumbling until he, until he moved up a weight and I think probably that's the fight that Joe would move up to lightweight for. Obviously he's got to do a job on Saturday and then, you know, probably a, a big fight, a unification fight suit forever. But in the back of Joe's mind, that's the fight that he would love to do. For you, Tony, listening to you speak, for Joe, is he more concerned about a unification as opposed to, say, maybe a Lee Wood or uh, one of the other domestic names which have moved up to 130 or planning to? I think he'd like to do, you know, I think Navarrete is number one on his list because he's probably the biggest name in the super featherweight division. But obviously, if the Lee, if the Lee Wood fight was there and, it, you know, it was good money, then obviously you've got to look at that fight because it's a big domestic fight. But um, at the moment, I think, like, you know, Joe would be looking at a Navarrete fight more than anything in a minute. Just sticking with the domestic route, um, what would it take to get that Lee Wood, over, Lee Wood fight over line, with the exception of the financials? Um, I've seen Joe kind of joke about wanting a Rolex from Eddie just to go up to the city ground. Do you think it would have to happen at the city ground? I know Joe spoke about wanting to fight at the Cardiff City Stadium. He's the champion, so does his kind of own thoughts and goals and ambitions weigh more than Lee because he holds a title? I think... Uh, Listen, it's all about the money. It's all, that's all it's about. And if that, if it's at the city ground and the money's there for the city ground, then Joe, Joe would fight at the city ground. And it, that's, that's all it's about, really. And uh, obviously, in an ideal world, Joe being the champion would like to defend at the Cardiff city ground. But, 
you know, if the money is at the city ground in Nottingham, and then you know, then that's where you'll go. That's where you'll go, and that's all it's about, really. When you get to this stage of your career now, is like defending your title for the most money, you know, and that's that's all Joe Caldina will be looking at. What did you make of Lee Wood's stunning stoppage victory against Josh Warrington when he kind of, by all accounts, for most people, was well behind on the cards at the point when he pulled it out of the bag? Yeah, it was fantastic, you know, and. Uh, as you say, he, he was way behind on points and he, and he pulled it out of the bag and he'd done the same thing against Conlon as well. And he's always got that, uh, you know, always got that equaliser, that power in both hands and, you know, uh, fair play to him. I like Lee Wood, he's, he's a good fighter and, uh, and I was pleased for him. So just away from Joe and what could be next for him and what he's going up against on Saturday night, just an update on Conor, where do things stand with his case with the board and you, Cad, have you had any more conversations there? Just, I'm just hearing that they're still going to do the appeal, but we don't know when. So in the meantime, uh, we're probably going to uh, set another fight for him and just see what happens, you know. So uh, until that appeal, we ain't going to wait for the appeal process uh, to pan out because uh, you just be, we might be sitting there forever. So uh, he's clear to fight. Uh, so um, he's just going to fight. Does Connor still want to fight before Christmas? He'd like to, yeah, he would like to. Where would you look to put that on? Obviously, when he came back, he was out in Florida. Do you think it's more likely that if he's going to return, if he isn't under a British Boxing Board of Control licence, you'll take him back out to the States? Maybe, um, maybe. But listen, there's a lot of people who are not on a British Boxing Board of Control licence. Tyson Fury is one of them. So, you know, I, I don't think it makes a lot of difference, really. He's, he's clear to fight. He's been cleared. So uh, it's just wherever match want to do his next fight. Are those conversations picking up at all about... Connor potentially picking up a license with a different um, organisation and then boxing over here in the UK? I don't know, I just leave all that to match him really to sort that out, do you know what I mean? That's fair enough, Tony. Just on an opponent front, obviously, we're not expecting that Eubank fight to take place next now, um, off of what, back of what you're saying as well. Who do you look at then as a potential opponent? I'll just let Matchroom do all that side of it. I don't really get involved in their side of it, who they're matching him with. Obviously, I look through the opponents when they're presented to me, but that's their side of it, the promotional side. So all that talk about you, Bank Fight, though, when would you look to maybe get that one over the line for? Not sure. Um, obviously, there's negotiations going on still, so we'll see anyway. Um, and Tony, just away from him as well, John Ryder, what's the latest with, with John? Yeah, uh, John's gonna fight, gonna, he's just in negotiations at the minute in, in a big fight with a big name. So that, that should be, uh, that should be uh, coming out pretty soon, within the next week or so, I think we'll announce that fight. Can you give me any more? Can I get you out of here? Yeah, that, that's what I've been told, so <laughs> yeah, we'll find out anyway. Um, Tony, I also bumped into Jordan Thompson at a show recently. I just wanted to kind of get an update from your perspective how he's been doing and what your plan's going to be with him moving forward. I imagine the move up to heavyweight now. Yeah, uh, I've only spoke to him a couple of times. I believe he's been on holiday, so I haven't really had a, a conversation with him as yet. But yeah, uh, so I don't know what his plans are, whether he will move up to heavyweight or not. So, as I say, once he comes off holiday, he, he'll decide what he wants to do. He's obviously a big boy for that weight. Um, do you feel like he could still make Cruiser comfortably or would you prefer him to be? I'm not sure whether he could or not. I think uh, that, was a, that was a massive struggle to make that weight. But obviously when you get offered a world title fight, you can't really turn it down. Um, just a final one from me, Tony. Fury and Garner this past weekend, what did you make of that fight? Yeah, he was like same as everyone else really. It was, he was really, really surprising. Uh, I'm not sure whether... I'm not. It's hard to know unless you're actually in camp with people, but it's hard to know whether Fury took that fight, uh, whether he took that fight and didn't really believe that Ngannou was going to be much of a threat to him. He, he, to me, if looking as a viewer, as a fan, he just didn't look in shape uh, at all physically and um, mentally. I don't really know what he was at, but he's probably the poorest you've ever seen him fight. And um, you know, uh, and obviously in Ghana, who put in the performance of his life. Most people I spoke to about um, after that fight, they obviously echoed the same words, weren't sure on his preparation, how he looked. Zhila Zhang said it was embarrassing for, for boxing to have seen that type of performance and how the fight unfolded. Do you understand where Zhila Zhang's coming from? Do you disagree with those comments? Yeah, sure. And like, you know, what people are saying and fans are saying, like, if it, if it was Fury going into the MMA, uh, into the cage, then you know what you know. 
you got to expect Ngannou to do to get that over and done with quick. And that's, that's what probably all the boxing fans was thinking as well, that it'd be over, get over and done with in a couple of rounds. But, you know, credit to Ngannou, he was a better boxer than everyone thought he was going to be. And, uh, you know, he put, put it on the line. And uh, to go in there in your first professional fight against someone of Tyson Fury's calibre, you've got to give him a lot of credit for that. Tony, whenever I've asked people about Fury Usyk previously, they've always kind of mentioned the size advantage of Tyson and how well he uses that to his advantage as being kind of a key factor for when, he, if he was to fight Alexander Usyk on the back of his most recent performance. Though, has your opinion changed at all on maybe how a Fury Usyk fight will play out? I think you still got to favour Fury. I mean, I, I don't think he. I, I can't see him coming in in that sort of condition ever again. I think he must go home and think like. He must feel embarrassed at that performance. And uh, it's just like, when you look at him and the shape he was in, he just looked awful, the shape he come in at. And I just don't believe that he would probably ever do that again. So I still think you've got he's got to be the favourite going into the fight, just like you say, because of his size and obviously his ability. But obviously people are going to start giving Usyk more of a chance now in the fight as they did before. But um, we've seen Fury do it before. He's... Um, He's put in bad performances before and then come back better the next time. So, you know, that's what I'm expecting him to come back a better fighter, really. Just on Francis Ngannou as well, Tony. There's a lot of talk about him sticking to the boxing world, some top heavyweights calling him out. One which comes to mind, Eddie's mentioned that Anthony Joshua fight. Anthony Joshua, Francis Ngannou, does it interest you on the back of what we saw? Yeah, sure. And Ngannou's got a stick at the boxing now, you know. He's uh, he had a massive payday there, more money than he'd ever... Ever, ever, ever earn, you know, from what he was doing before, and um, you know, all the big, all the big heavyweights like Joshua, Zhang, uh, Wilder, they've all got to be looking to fight him now, you know. So he's got to stick at the boxing, and as I said earlier, he's a, he's a lot better boxer than we even was going to give him credit for. So he, he's got to be doing that. Fancy getting him into the matchroom gym? About that, he's a big old lump now, isn't he? <laughs> I don't fancy your arms after those after those pads. Big lump, mate. He's strong as well, isn't he? Listen, Tony, it's a pleasure to catch up with you. Obviously, good luck on Saturday night. I'm sure I'll see you around before, though. Thank you for speaking to me. No problem. Thanks very much.